Well, thank you, Anton and worship team, for that great song during the offering, Your Grace Finds Me. Here at Chapel Street, our prayer and our hope is that His grace would indeed find you uh, right where you are. Well, like many of you here today, my mom and dad have a great love story. Uh, They're in the twilight of that love story these days. My mom's 89, my dad is 86. They're both experiencing some of the health issues that come along with the aging process. Um, But they've been married 63 years, 64 years this August. And like many love stories, theirs had kind of an unlikely beginning. My mom grew up in the hills of eastern Kentucky, coal mining country, and a family where girls, and there were four of them in her family, just were not expected to go to college at all. They were expected to get married as teenagers, start having babies, or just go to work. But my mom was a good student. In fact, she loved school and eventually was the valedictorian of her high school class. I love this picture of her. Even so, after she graduated, she just went to work because that's what girls did. And she worked full time for four or five years and finally got up the courage to tell her parents that she wanted to go to college. So she enrolled at Taylor University in Indiana as a 24-year-old freshman. Switched over to my dad. My dad grew up as the youngest of six children. Uh, In a single-parent home, his father had died when he was only about five years old, leaving his mother to raise six kids in post-depression small-town America. To say they were poor would be a vast understatement. But my dad came to faith in Christ as a teenager. I'll tell some of that story a little bit later this morning. And immediately felt called to preach. He uh, went after high school to a small Bible college in Iowa for a year. Handsome guy. Some people think I look like him, but... um, And he transferred after a year to Taylor University in Indiana, where he worked his way through school by being a pastor of small rural congregations. And my dad and my mom met there at Taylor. He noticed her and eventually uh, approached her, I think, in the library that year and uh, said to her, um, hey, would you you like to go out to dinner sometime? And to his surprise, she said she would. And for reasons he still doesn't quite understand, he said to her, well, then... um, Good, I'll look around campus see if I can find someone to take you out, he said. She says, to this day, she says she was so mad, she swore to herself she would never speak to that boy again. Well, eventually he asked her appropriately, and somewhat surprisingly, she said yes. And at that very first date, he said to her, if you don't want to get serious with me, then you ought to stop dating me because I'm going to marry you, he said. And just a few months later, like six months later, he did. My dad knew what he was after. Now, today we're looking, continue to look at one of the great love stories in the Bible. It comes to us in the ancient book of Ruth. And the story, if you've been with us for the last uh, month or so, uh, unfolds like a dramatic play with key characters being introduced to us scene after scene. Let me give you a quick review. In chapter 1, we meet a man named Elimelech who takes his wife Naomi and their two sons away from Israel because there's a famine in the land, which is bad news. They go to Moab, which is even worse news because Moab was not a place Israelites wanted to go. It was a pagan nation seen as uh, a place that was, uh, that was cursed. There, both sons marry Moabite women, which is also bad news because the Moabites were pagans. One of those women is named Ruth. Elimelech dies. Both sons die. Really bad news. Naomi and Ruth go back to Bethlehem in, in Israel because they hear that the barley harvest has just begun, which is a little hint of good news. Chapter 2, we are introduced to this man named Boaz, a prominent and wealthy man who happens to be a family relative of Naomi and Elimelech, a very wealthy relative, a man called a guardian redeemer, or your translation might say a kinsman redeemer, which is good news. He shows great kindness, abundant kindness to Ruth, allowing her to glean in his field and giving her enough food for them to eat. And then in chapter 3, where we were last week, the drama becomes an unlikely romantic story. And a scene that I'm sure it seemed very weird to you when you heard it. And if you haven't read it, go back and read the book of Ruth. Naomi tells Ruth to go to the threshing floor where they were wrapping up the harvest and to uncover Boaz's feet. It's a little weird. And then to lay down with him in the threshing floor and that he will tell her what to do. Now, it seems weird to us, but that was just her way of offering herself and making herself available to be redeemed. She was surrendering to her redeemer to, if he desired, become his wife. Now, Boaz tells Ruth that he wants to redeem her, but there's another relative who has a closer relationship who has the right of first refusal. So to do this right, he's got to approach him. If that man is unwilling, then he certainly will become her redeemer. And that leads us to where we are today, the beginning of chapter four, 
which is the last chapter of the book of Ruth. I'm going to read through these verses, stopping along the way to point out some, some really interesting cultural things, and then we'll see what we learn today. Ruth chapter 4, verse 1. So meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Let me pause there. So Boaz is waiting for this other relative who's got a closer relationship because he needs to negotiate with him about this whole process. Now, they sit down at the town gate because that's just how you did it in the ancient world. That was where significant business was conducted. And it was like for us going to the town hall or to the government center. But verse 2, Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Also a cultural thing. You needed 10 elders of the town to uh, bear witness to any significant business transaction to make sure it was all done appropriately, like, like making sure you have your team of lawyers there when you buy a business or you buy a home or something like that. Verse 3, then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So evidently, Naomi still owned a piece of land that had belonged to her husband, Elimelech. Uh, this would explain, uh, for example, where Naomi and Ruth lived when they came back after 10 years. Must have been some dwelling place still on that property. Now, you might ask, now, if they had land, why was uh, Ruth gleaning, basically begging for food? Well, over 10 years, the land had laid fallow and was now overrun with weeds or whatever. They lacked the resources to redevelop the land. So the land now is sort of on the market. Verse 4. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest, suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Okay, so the unnamed relative says he'll take the land because owning more land was good in those days, just like it would be in our day. It made him wealthier as a businessman. But Boaz isn't finished with the deal yet. Verse 5, then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. Boom, Boaz drops the bomb. Now, we don't really see it that way. It just seems like an ancient story to us. But why does Boaz wait till now to mention this sort of significant detail? Oh, by the way, when you buy the land, you get a wife too. Okay? Here's what's happening, at least we think. We know that Boaz already wants to redeem Ruth. That's what the whole threshing floor thing was about. He wants to take her as his wife. But the law requires him to offer the opportunity to this other guy because he had a closer relationship. Now, he doesn't want the other guy to take him up on it, but he has to offer so he waits, he offers the land first, gets the guy interested. Then he says, oh, by the way, there's a complication. You're going to take on a wife in this process. He wants to discourage the other guy. Verse 6, at this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. So the first thing we want to look at here is the price of redemption. The price of redemption, about two months after my wife and I were married in 1985, we went to Bolivia, South America on a short-term mission commitment. We were both teaching English as a second language in a large evangelical university in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, and I was coaching and playing basketball with a local team. It was a great adventure for us as newlyweds, uh, different language, different culture, and here and there, there were these little, you know, cultural moments. Uh, one day I had to go to the city center in Santa Cruz to do some sort of errand. I don't remember what. Um, but I went in the middle of the day, which is kind of a rush hour in Latin culture because uh, they take siesta at noon until about four when they start working again. So there are cars everywhere downtown. And I parked my car. I, we were, I was driving this little Brazilian car at the time. Uh, it looked exactly like this, only um, if you imagine that car dragged through the ocean floor by, for about 20 years, it looked like that. No air conditioning. Shocks didn't work. It stalled out quite often, especially on hot days. This was a hot day. I was parked downtown rush hour. I was done. I went to back out of my parking space, and the car stalled out. Just stopped right in the middle of the street in the middle of rush hour. People start honking. And driving in Bolivia is just crazy. People drive on sidewalks. They honk like crazy. So people are honking. They're gesturing out the window. And I'm the gringo stuck in the street with my little Brazilian car. So I jump out. I'm sweating. I'm trying to push it back into the into the parking spot to get out of the street. And just then, a Bolivian police officer comes running up, looks at me, waves, and starts pushing the other side of the car with me. 
I'm thinking, what a guy. You know, what a country. He pushes me right into the, into the spot there. So I'm out of the street, all done. I walk over to thank him. Gracias, mi amigo. And he says, your license, please. And this is all happening in Spanish, and my Spanish is bad. But he asked for my driver's license. Now, later I would learn never to give your driver's license to a Bolivian police officer. You were supposed to hold it up so they could see it, but never give it to him. And here's why. He took my license. I was just a good citizen, gave him my license. He took it. He looked at it. He put it in his pocket, and he started to walk away. I was like, oh, senor, senor policeman, sir, my license. He turned around and he just wagged his finger. He said, no, 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 no. You caused a big problem out there. Why were you illegally parked? I didn't know if I understood him right. I said, but I, was, I wasn't parked. You, you saw me. I was broken down. My car wouldn't work. And you helped me. Thank you. He said, no, no, no. You caused a big problem. Cars everywhere. And then I realized what he wanted. He was holding my license hostage because he wanted a little compensation, Right? Uh, now, we would call that a bribe. In Bolivia, they just considered it a tip uh, because police officers didn't make much money. And so this is just, you, you know, so I said, I have dollars. And without even blinking, he said, how many? I said, cinco, five. Now, I had more than that, but I wanted to start low. So I said, five. And he said, hmm, and turned around and started walking away. He goes, oh, senor, senor. And I said, and uh, five million pesos. Now, it sounds like a lot. It was like $3 U.S. And he stopped, though, and he went, Cinco y cinco, está bien. He walked over, handed me my license, gave me a big handshake, big hug, like we were best friends. So I discovered that day the price of redemption, and fortunately it was a price that I could afford to pay. So here in the story, Boaz sits down to negotiate with this other guy, this other redeemer. All the elders of the town are looking on. He offers the land, the property of Elimelech, and the guy says, good, I'll buy it. Then he says... On the day you buy the land, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with this property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because it might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. So when Boaz mentions Ruth, the whole deal falls apart. Why? Okay, let's look at the details. On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite. So my friend, you want to buy the land? Good. You get two women with the land. You get Naomi, who's the Limelech's widow. She's older. And you also get the son's widow, Ruth, who is younger. And, by the way, she's a Moabite. She's from a foreign place, and they were our, uh, Israel's enemies. And then he says, in order to maintain the name of the dead. Now, that doesn't mean anything to us, really. But it meant a lot in that culture. It meant that was to continue the family line. And the only way you could do that was by having children. So, she's going to become your wife, she's going to bear children, and they are also going to be your children. Now, land was one thing, a wife and her mother-in-law and potential children was a whole different story. Land would bring a profit, make him a wealthier man. But a wife was going to cost us something. There's a joke there, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> children are expensive. He'd be bringing two women into his home to provide for both of them for the rest of his life or their lives. And then Ruth was going to bear children. She was of childbearing age. Who knows how many children she was going to have. You got food, you got clothing, you got travel sports, you got college. I don't know about that in those days, but all that stuff. And on top of that, those children now, listen, are going to be part of his inheritance that he leaves behind. They have a claim in his estate. Now, if he had other children, it's all going to get divided a different way. In any case, either this guy, whose name we do not know, did not have the resources, or he was simply unwilling to pay that price. Now, there are three issues at play here. Remember what a guardian redeemer was. A guardian redeemer or a kinsman redeemer was one with the position to redeem, one who had the resources to redeem, and one who was willing to redeem. I wonder if that reminds you of anything. In the New Testament, Colossians, book of Colossians, Paul writes... The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He's talking about Jesus, of course, the one who has the position to redeem because all things were made for him and through him. 
Second, in 1 Peter, we read, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Peter is saying, Jesus is the one who has the resources to redeem. And the resources he uses, of course, had to do with his precious blood shed on the cross for our redemption. And in John chapter 15, we see the third thing. Jesus points to himself as the one who is willing to redeem. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. I wonder if you have ever been in a season of your life when you have wondered if you were wanted by God. If you've ever wondered if maybe you were irredeemable because of something in your life, something in your past. I heard a woman say one time, she was actually at a baptism at South Street Campus. She said, I always, she looked back at her, her broken family. She looked at her own life full of failure and mistakes. She said, I always just assumed God hated me, she said. She needed to know that she was wanted by her Redeemer. I had a man call me one time years ago, asked to see me because he needed to talk about something important. And when, he, when we met, what he talked about was a great personal failure in his life years before, something he'd never told anyone, something of which he was deeply ashamed. And his question to me was, Pastor, I need to know, will that great failure, will my sin keep me out of heaven? He needed to know that he had a redeemer who had the resources, who was willing to pay that price for him, and maybe you need to know that this morning. Maybe you need to know there is one who has the position, there is one who has the resources, there is one who is willing to pay the price for your redemption. The second thing we see in the story is the purpose of redemption. That was the price, this is the purpose. Back to my mom and dad just for a minute. Not only did they have an unlikely love story, both of them had kind of unlikely faith stories or faith journeys. Both of them were the very first believers in their family, which meant they both came to faith in Christ without the support, help, or encouragement of their own homes and families. I wonder if anyone here uh, could say that about yourself. Are you the first? Anyone here is the first believer in their family? Okay. Look how few hands. That's unusual. Tells you the importance of family when it comes to faith formation, but it also tells you that God can do some unusual things, okay? My, as I mentioned, my dad lost his father when he was only five. He eventually lost his two older brothers to alcoholism early in their lives. He believes he was likely in that same exact path if it were not for a couple of high school football buddies who invited him at age 15 to go to a Methodist revival meeting one night. He went, heard the gospel, and gave his heart to Jesus, and his whole trajectory was changed in that one night. My mom remembers that her family never went to church because her dad owned a liquor store in a small town in eastern Kentucky. And her mom was so embarrassed that she wouldn't go to church because all the townspeople thought certain things of her husband who ran a liquor store. But my mom, my mom was about 19 years old. She went to a small country mission church, pastored by a missionary lady, and heard a sermon, and she realized that she didn't know God. And so she gave her heart to Jesus that night at 19, and the trajectory of her life changed completely. Now I'm going to pause that story right there. I'll come back to it. Verse 7. Now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. Now this, this funny little cultural detail is um, a good example of the, the genuineness of, of the Old Testament story in the record. Like, why would you even include this if it didn't happen this way? This is sort of a, 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 a symbolic thing to indicate one person conceding ownership to another person. It's like a handshake deal, like giving you my word, or even like signing a contract, taking off your sandal. Verse 8, so the guardian re redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today 
you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon, that's the two sons, and I've also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown today you are witnesses. Now, this reads like the legal language in a contract, and it is. Boaz is is dictating the terms of the deal. It's all being witnessed by witnesses and elders and probably recorded down somewhere because he wants to make sure the deal is done. He wants to make sure the deal is sealed for all time. And by the way, did you know that this is how the New Testament describes your salvation? In the book of Ephesians, Paul writes, first we believe, first we hear the gospel, then we believe in Christ as our Savior and Lord. Then, says the Holy Spirit, seals our hearts. The word seal is a business transaction. It's like stamping a contract. Same thing is happening here. But we also see something else here in this story. We see purpose. We see the purpose behind the whole thing in order to maintain the name of the dead of this property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today are you, you are witnesses. Now what's God up to here? What's so important about this man and his family? God's clearly redeeming more than a piece of property. He's clearly redeeming more than one older widow, Naomi. He's clearly redeeming more than one younger woman, Ruth, who was also a widow. He's redeeming a whole family line a whole family tree. And Limelech had taken his family to Moab, a place far from the promise and blessing of God, and he died there. Both his sons died there, which meant his family line was finished. No legacy at all done. But God has something else in mind. God has something bigger in mind. He provides a redeemer. And through Boaz and Ruth, the family line is going to continue. Now, I've got to give you a spoiler alert here because we're not going to get there until next week. But we're going to see eventually that God is not just redeeming Naomi. God is not just redeeming Ruth. He's not even just redeeming Boaz and the whole family line. He's redeeming the whole world. But we're going to get there next week. The third thing we see in, in this part of the story is the promise of redemption. So we have the price and we have... Uh, the promise of redemption here. Verse 11. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home, that's Ruth, like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. Now pause there, Rachel and Leah, you probably are familiar with. They're the two wives of Jacob, who between them and their handmaids, that's kind of a messy story, uh, produced 12 sons, who become the 12 tribes of Israel. The blessing continues. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Now, we've all heard of Bethlehem, right? We know Bethlehem, right? Remember Bethlehem? Most scholars think that Ephrathah is just another name for that similar region because the word Ephrathah means fruitful. Bethlehem means house of bread. The word famous here in Hebrew means literally to call a name, to make a name known. This should begin to remind us of something. What name became famous in Bethlehem. The prophet Micah wrote, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. This is a messianic prophecy. This is talking about the one who would come, the promised one, the king who would be famous, and the New Testament directly applies this prophecy to Jesus who was born in Bethlehem. See how the pieces are coming together? Verse 12, last verse we look at today. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Huh? What's this about? Well, all kinds of things are going on here. This is a blessing. It's also a kind of prophecy. Ruth will bear children like Rachel and Leah, lots of them. A name will become famous in Bethlehem. But the most interesting and somewhat shocking reference here, and we might miss it completely, is Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Does anybody recognize that story here at all? You've been reading in Genesis chapter 38 lately? Probably not. Well, it's not a pretty story. In fact, it's one of the most sordid and broken stories in the whole Bible. Genesis 38. Let me summarize it for you, give you a short version, and I'll I'll, I'll clean it up a bit 
for the kids. Judah was one of the sons born to Leah. He had a son named Ur, who married a foreign woman, a Canaanite named Tamar. Following so far? Ur then dies, and according to the custom of the time, called Leverite marriage, the woman would be passed on to the next son, so she was protected. This is how they did things. However, that other brother dies too. And then Tamar becomes upset because Judah won't give her the third son to be her husband. So, in a very ugly and unsavory series of events, Tamar disguises herself as a prostitute, seduces her father-in-law Judah, and the result of that relationship is Perez. Perez then becomes the ancestor, the great, great, great grandfather of Boaz. Again, we're going to get there next week. So what's the point of all this? Why is this little story in your Bible? Here's why. God redeems that which seems irredeemable. God redeems that which seems irredeemable. God restores that which seems broken beyond repair. God brings hope to the seemingly hopeless. God brings life where there has only been death. And my guess is that at least some of us here today have been there. And maybe there are there now. Some of us know what it's like to look back and see, see a family tree with some broken and twisted branches. Maybe you are the product of such a family tree. Maybe you know words like, like addiction or divorce or abuse. Maybe you have a son or a daughter who's been off in Moab for a long time. Maybe you have another relative, a parent, who's been off in Moab for a long time. And it's tempting to lose hope. Maybe even stop praying for them because, back to my mom and dad for a second, if you could have taken a snapshot of my dad's life at age 15, if you could have taken a snapshot of my mom's life at 19, you would have seen a lot of loss. A lot of brokenness. Two pretty gnarled up, crooked family trees. But God had something much better in mind, much bigger in mind. Eventually, God used each of them to bring almost every member of both families to faith in Christ. Took time. And then through 60 years of ministry across 10 different churches in five states, they've been able to touch countless people, produce dozens and dozens of pastors and missionaries who then went out all over the country, all over the world, and touched more people. My brother and I are the product of that straightened out family tree branch and the churches we've been blessed to serve over the years. Do you see what's going on? Can you start to see and pull back and see the picture? When God redeemed my mom and dad, he didn't just redeem two individuals, he redeemed two family trees. And not just two family trees, but potentially all the other people and family trees that that family tree touched. Do you see? There's a whole forest of family trees being touched, and the same is true for your family tree. This is why the story is here. This is why this book of Ruth matters to us. Because God redeems. He does so much more, has something so much bigger in mind than we can even see. So much bigger than what he does for Naomi. Bigger than what he does for Ruth. More than even Boaz could imagine. Because he redeems. And God is up to something so much bigger in your life and in your family tree than you could ever imagine. Because He redeems. We bow with me as I close today. Lord, we thank you for your word, for this strange and beautiful story of brokenness and redemption and hope. Remind us through these ancient characters that you're still in the business of redemption, that you have the position, you have the resources, and you are the one who is willing to redeem even us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.